Hello everyone and welcome to another lockdown interview. On today's interview I'm joined by movie star's Danish neopro Matthias Norskog Jansen. Matthias began his career with SEG Racing Academy before moving to Giant Castelli and then to Rival Readiness before he moved to World Tour side Movie Star this year. He has already demonstrated his immense talent for time trials by winning the Danish Under-23 title in 2018 as well as finishing third in the Under-23 World Championships time trial that same year in Innsbruck. Matthias also won the first stage in the Tour de l'Avenir last year after a breakaway and as a result he also had the Leaders jersey on for a number of days. Despite only joining the World Tour this year, Matthias already has a record on the World Tour which I will let him share in the interview. Lots to discuss so without further ado, here's the interview with Matthias Norsko Jansen. Hi Matthias, how are you? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, where are you now and how has the lockdown been affecting you? Um, I'm in Denmark right now. I'm, I'm staying at my, uh, at my mother. In Denmark, we're not so uh, affected by it right now because it's quite a small country. So it's much easier to control compared to Spain and Italy. I think we are really lucky that we are only five or six million uh, people. Right now, the only thing we can do is go to the nightclubs and, and stuff like that. But we can... Uh, we can train, we can uh, ride together um, as long as we keep uh, quite good distance uh, to people we don't know. But with my training group, I, I know everybody. And, and as a professional cyclist, it's not that different from being in season because when, when I'm in season, I'm, not, I'm quite isolated uh, because I'm tired and just want to rest or train hard and, uh, and eat. So I'm not that uh, socialized uh, normally. So uh, it's actually okay for me. So this is your first year on the World Tour. You signed with Movie Star, but you haven't yeah. actually been able to do any races for them. Why is that? Because uh, in December, uh, I was out riding uh, around my, my home in, in Girona. And I came uh, yeah, across uh, a car right before I passed him. I was just went straight into me and it's still... Uh, I can't explain why he did it, but uh, because it feels so. He was going into a parking lot, and uh, I, I was just in his way. <laughs> so I went straight into a, the pole, uh, the light pole, as you call it, um, and I broke my leg in, in two two places. So it's been a really long uh, recovery for me. And at first, I thought that yeah, this is probably gonna take maybe four months or so. So I could still make it to to maybe do Paris Europe. Then the, the the lockdown came and but I was not ready then. I'm not even ready now and it's half a year uh, since I'm still uh, having big troubles because there's not so much healing yet. So I cannot do sprints and stuff like that. And if you want to do a bike race, you need to yeah sprint at least uh, 1200 watts, uh, I guess. So there's a really long way still to come. Have you been doing any uh, training on Swift or anything like that? To kind of help yeah, them. because uh, I got like a, a rough inside my phone. So from knee to angle, I had uh, this uh, uh, it's a nail, uh, titanium. Uh, so it keeps the, the fracture uh, together. So I can actually walk. I could walk after four weeks or so. Uh, but I could also uh, ride uh, pretty well uh, inside on my home trainer. So I used the... Uh, January, February, uh, March on Swift every day, just doing uh, even a race or yeah, group ride because uh, I was not ready to go on the road because all the bumps, uh, it hurt a lot. Uh, and when the lockdown came, I was like, okay, I'm going to take a big responsibility uh, as a pro rider because I wanted to show that it's possible to stay inside even though you're a professional. So I said in a podcast, not right until the end of uh, April. I, I kept uh, training inside, um, but then there was a complication uh, with my fracture. And after four months, I was like, uh, I was at the scan at the hospital and they were not quite sure if uh, the fracture would heal because uh, there was a big, uh, when they, put the fracture back together after the surgery, there was still a big gap uh, and it was not possible for for the fracture to to heal because there was no contact. So uh, after four months, I was like, I'm, I'm still, I'm still 
and I was just looking into a longer injury if I kept kept riding. So I stopped riding for for four weeks and just started walking and tried to put as much pressure, but still keep it uh, steady and under pressure so it could start uh, yeah, maybe heal again. But it was like really unsecure future for me back then uh, because there was nothing to do with a fracture. You, it's not like a muscle. You can train it hard and then it will grow. A fracture just needs time. So you're quite fortunate then that the World Tour calendar has actually been pushed into this tightly squashed period. Do you think it's realistic that you could actually go for Paru Bay this year or is it is it still too, too early? I still want to believe it because... I just keep putting diesel on the on, uh, on the fire because for me the classics will always be my main goal. What I dreamed about when I was a kid, when everybody else was dreaming about Tour de France, I was dreaming about uh, Paris Roubaix. So I just I don't want to ask myself the question now. But to be honest, when I go into a bump now, even couples, it feels really strange for my leg. So to do. Uh, a sector like yeah, Armberg would be, for me, I think it would be too early this year to, to do it, but still I just miss racing. So to come back and do a 1.1 race would be a victory for me. I was really lucky because for myself, it felt like a lot of weight uh, came off my shoulders when the Corona crisis came out because I was like, I was working really hard to get back show me that movie star didn't invest in a wasted talent that they could really count on me when they started canceling races i was just like okay now i can breathe i can actually take it really slow and maybe get back uh, in a proper way but then i started thinking about yeah but if they start to close the teams if uh, there will be 50 world tour riders without a team yeah then maybe in 2021 when the uh, my contract is over and I think it was pretty hard for me to resign because I'm I'm still young and, and, and this injury doesn't help on my development. But I think if I keep doing the right things, I, I could actually become a established rider on the world tour. But uh, yeah, I'm just really worried about the whole situation right now. How has it been um, joining Movistar, being with like the likes of Valverde and is the reason you chose Movistar is because they're not really a classics, cobble classics team. So you might actually have a bigger role in the Paro Bay than if you joined like a more established team that where you would just be kind of a helper in the beginning and then not do anything. It's obviously that if I would join a team like Quickstep, uh, the Koenig. I wouldn't be able to do uh, maybe any classics uh, in my near pro uh, year, but signing with Movistar, I would be able to, I was like, at our first meeting, I, I asked them if I wasn't naive to think that I could do, uh, you know, Flanders and Robert the same year, and they was like, you can't even say no. Uh, because that's why we bought you. For me, as uh, what do we call it, a talent. Or so, so uh, it's really big for me to just explore the races uh, without any pressure and uh, still be able to yeah do all the big classics. Because I think it's really important that you get, get used to it. So when I'm 30 years old and I'm on my top level, I would say that, okay, I've been doing this race seven years in a row now, so I know everything about it. And uh, especially the Flanders Classic, really need to know the road. But yeah, it, it was really important for me to be able, already as my first year, to do, uh, to do one of, at least two or three of the Classics. Um, because it's obviously that I it would be really hard for me to join a Grand Tour team on Movistar because it's one of the best uh, Grand Tour teams uh, on the World Tour. That would probably be easier on another team, but but still, it's for me uh, my career. I want to do. Uh, yeah, I want to develop into a good classics rider. Right now, I don't care about Tour de France. Uh, uh, so still, I, I would love to do uh, Grand Depart next year in Copenhagen. But I think it's just too early right now. Just going back to your career, so like start of your career, you rode with SEG uh, Racing Academy. You rode with Rival Readiness and uh, Giant Castelli. So uh, all kind of continental teams. 
and in 2018 you actually you became the under 23 danish time trial champion and that's a title that's becoming ever more competitive as denmark's well we see, it seems like we have this you guys are part of this golden generation for us uh, how how was that year for you 2018 and you even came fifth in the in the elite category as well i think it was uh, it was not the most important year for me because i think Coming back from SEG was a really awful year for me, but joining Jankin Stilly was probably, uh, if I could say that this is a turning point for me, it would be Jankin Stilly because I came to a team where we really, we were best friends and I learned to know Mikkel uh, Björk well and Rasmus uh, Kjell also. Uh, I learned the importance of, of aerodynamic and I think that's why I could uh, reach such a high level already in 2018 because I, I came uh, Danish champion in 2018, but I was not the best uh, TT rider in Denmark. It, it was uh, Mikkel who also became a world champion that year for the second time in a row. But still, I think after the Worlds, I was just like, gave me so much confidence to know that I was one of the best in the world. I'm still really proud of that day today. But I think joining Castelli and, and getting to know uh, uh, Mikkel well was really a good opportunity for me to, to grow. Because if I kept, uh, if I would have been resigning with SEG, I think I would not have reached any good level in, in TTs because I didn't know anything about aerodynamics and I didn't know the importance of it. Uh, and you can still see in, in, in countries like Belgium and yeah, Netherlands, they don't really uh, do the same stuff as uh, we do in Denmark uh, because we have Martin Toft, uh, Matt and, and guys like that who are showing the the way uh, showing a good road for, for, for the young guys. Even uh, juniors in Denmark are getting air t testing uh, on, the, on the track. And yeah, it's just, it's like a revolution right now. And yeah, as you said, it's getting more and more competitive in Denmark. Uh, last year we had Johan Price winning uh, the Under-23 championship two months after. He, he won the European in front of uh, Mikkel. And I think, I still believe that day today that I could have taken the bronze medal. But uh, yeah, there was only uh, two spots uh, for the Europeans. So that's yeah, one of the toughest years in, in, for Danish cycling to get selected for any championship. It's, it's really special. Also because we are really good friends. Going into the Europeans, we were training uh, me, Mikkel and, and Johan in Girona, uh, living under the same roof. And uh, we were just really good friends. But, you know, when you get into a competition, you, you of course, you change mindset. You're really con competitive. But when you come back to your normal life and you need to train hard, I know that I could, I can always count on Miguel to, to push me uh, even further in, in, in my development. It's also a co coincidence that we have so many strong people at, at the same year, the same generation. Big part of the answer is the, that we know aerodynamics really well. Yeah, I don't know. How many Danish pros now are there on the world tour? I think it's 22. Yeah, it's 22. crazy. It's, it's just like, when, when, not that I want to uh, talk about myself in a bad way, but when guys like me start to uh, join the world tour, uh, 10 years ago, it was not possible, I think, because then you needed to be really good, like Maci Potential and Diego Fuglsang to, to join the, the World Tour. But right now, you just have a golden age. So everybody knows that if you have a Dane on the team, he will probably develop, develop in a good way. You, you see Mats Peterson and, and guys like that. So like you saw in, in, uh, in the last decade where everybody was talking about uh, the Colombians, I think we have some of the same uh, capabilities there. We will never be good climbers, but I think in the in the classics and on TTs uh, and stuff like that, I think uh, we are really uh, in a high value right now. Yeah, well, in the classics, as you were saying, Mas Peterson came second in the Flanders and uh, Kasper Eskrein. So did that kind of give you a bit of confidence as well, seeing those guys just getting on the podium on like one of the hardest classics of the year? Does the Flanders suit you? 
with the hills or not? Uh, it's not really suiting me well. Also because of, uh, yeah, because of the hills, because they're quite steep uh, and it's quite a hilly race, but uh, yeah, but we will see. But I did, I don't know if it gave me uh, any confidence because I, I know that Mats and, and Casper is, is much better bike rider than me. But when you see some of your own uh, competitors doing the last four years doing really good in big races just give you confidence and and also in the peloton it gives you like okay they know when 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 i was on the 23 we were doing the nations cup and everybody knew that okay we are the, the danish guys are gonna give get, get their space in the, in the peloton and we could just uh, do whatever we wanted for a long time the juniors in denmark has been really good but then they started to come to uh, under 23 and it was just like there was a lot of space where very talented riders were just getting wasted uh, in the process and maybe joining we saw guys like Thomas Quist uh, joining quick step but he was he just didn't uh, get through the the process came back to country level and and stopped racing so we had had a lot of uh, good juniors for, for for many many years, but it was just it seems so hard to jump from juniors to the senior ranks. Uh, and I think the develop in uh, development in Denmark and and, and the, the national coaches in Denmark are just uh, being more and more pros and and more Danes are starting to to be able to live like pros in in. In, in countries like Girona, we have our, our small community in Girona, so we don't feel like we are a long time away from home, but still have a, a good community uh, down south in, in Europe uh, to have a good training environment. And um, yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's took a long time, but now we're here and I think we're going to stay here for a long time. So you also had uh, a few other notable results. Do you want a stage in the Tour de l'Avenir? What was that day like? Because that was the first stage of the 2019 Tour de l'Avenir. I spent almost uh, the whole 2019 in, in the early breakaways uh, trying to read something because I knew that one day they could just let me go. I would be really hard to 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 catch. Um, it was just in my mind. I was not telling anybody about it, but it was my. I thought that it was my only way to to win a bike race, and I was in the peace race uh, for for under twenty three. It was also a nation's cup. I broke my chain. Uh, I think it was two kilometers from from the finish line, and I was just devastated after that because I. Just needed one big result to 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 tell the world to teams that yeah I can TT but I can also win a a, a proper bike race. It was really hard for me uh, that day in 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 the peace race, but I I came to 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 eleven year in really really good shape. I lost five kilos during the summer break and um, I was probably in the best shape of my life. Um, and I came there, I, I went straight to attacking myself uh, after 1K and uh, came in a two-man break with Slovenian guy. Yeah, 40 Ks from uh, from the finish line, I was just going all out and doing uh, what I do best, TT uh, riding. Yeah, and I ended up winning that stage uh, with 50 seconds or so, and I kept it, you know, jersey for two days. But after that stage, I got in contact with a few World Tour teams because it's a really big race for for amateurs and uh, under 23 riders. So uh, that was really, really important uh, result. And I don't think I could have reached uh, the World Tour without that result, to be honest. Um, you also, with Rasmus Quaid, won the Duo Norman. That race seems quite unique because it's you're doing a time trial as a pairing. And it's quite an old yeah. race as well. And you've done it before yeah. as well. Yeah, I've done it before uh, with uh, Mikkel Björk, 2017, right after his, his first uh, World Tour title in, in in Norway. And it was just like, uh, it was one week pre, um, pre-Worlds pre in, in Yorkshire. So it was, I was in really good shape. And, and Rasmus is always strong. He's uh, like a monster on a bike. And we were having a really bad day because he lost his chain ring twice and uh, his, uh, 
his aero bars uh, fell out, so he was just riding with one hand on the bar, but we were still winning with one minute or so. I, I actually thought after that day that I could do something big at the Worlds, but um, yeah, I, I came fourth and it was a really big disappointment for me because I was literally the first one to nothing. And I knew how much the pre-year gave me in Innsbruck and it was really uh, hard to swallow that one. And I also knew that some of the World Tour teams were watching me to see if I could get a medal again. And I failed uh, in that uh, goal. And I was like four, four seconds or, or so from from the bronze medal. And you know, you, you I could just see where I lost them. I, I thought about everything and it was really, really, it was hard to uh, get back on track because I already needed to do a world, uh, the road race two days after. Doing Oman was really special because it was also my first 1.1 uh, uh, victory. And uh, sharing that one with uh, a great rider like Rasmus, he's, a, he's quite a big name in Denmark. Uh, he has his own uh, TV movie and has always been there, like one of the TT phenomenons in, in Denmark. Even came uh, sixth awards in in Italy, so yeah, he's he's a really big uh, talent. I don't think he's a talent anymore. He's getting older and older, but was still I could see him as one of the the guys who would go to a World Tour because he could be really important for for a team. He could just sit for six hours and in the front of a, a peloton and just ride. He's uh, he he got a big big motor. Did he have his special moustache when he was riding with you? Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't remember. I I think he had a big beard, or or he, yeah, yeah, he had a big beard. Yeah, he's a funny guy, always something uh, new. I saw a tweet from uh, Pro Second Stats where he was uh, comparing uh, four of the previous uh, mock shots uh, from from the teams. And he had different styles every year. Some some days he had this uh, this funny mustache, like in the old days. And then he has a big beard and long hair, and then he was completely shaved. And yeah, he's he's, <laughs> he's a really funny guy. Even though you haven't ridden a race yet for Movie Star, you still have a record in the World Tour of being the tallest rider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> We have uh, on movie star. We have the smallest uh, and the tallest. Yeah, she's a she's a woman on the women's world tour, and on the men's world tour, the tallest. Uh, so we had a funny funny photo shoot. It was really awkward for me because it was the first time I ever met her, and uh, it was the last day on the, on on the team came. But I haven't spoke to her. Uh, I was just focusing on uh, getting to know my own teammate because I think it was really big impression for me to get to Pamplona and meet everybody. I was like, there was 80 people and I was used to uh, rival uh, readiness and where we were maybe 18 riders and four staff. <laughs> so it was quite overwhelming for me. But yeah, I was less, uh, holding her in my hands and there was like half a meter uh, difference between us. But uh, yeah, I, I have the record for being the world tallest uh, world tour rider. I was really lucky. Ah, I was not lucky because I could really see Conor Downey on the, on the world tour because he's a really strong guy and he he knows he knew how to get in a in a, in a break and this seems like uh, really unfair for him not to resign with Israel uh, startup nation. But uh, when he he's, when he quit uh, uh, re, when he retired his career, uh, I came the the, the world tour cyclist and the world tallest uh, on the world tour ever. So yeah, it's a quite special re uh, record for me. So how, so, uh, how tall are you precisely? 2.02, two uh, uh, yeah, 202 centimeters. So yeah, I'm even taller than Michael Jordan and, and, and the guys and uh, some of the guys in uh, the last dance on, on Netflix. So yeah, <laughs> when I watch them and see, uh, that they are only 10 kilograms uh, heavier than me. And I'm like, whoa, they are like looking really, really uh, huge and, and, and fit. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm really trying to stay on 85 kilograms uh, 
and I'm always hungry all the time. But watching them being uh, so explosive and uh, yeah, I I should have gone basketballing instead. <laughs> I don't know, but the Danes are really bad in basketball. Do you have any problems with with your height in terms of like the UCI regulations with the TT bars? I think there's something like you your they don't account for tall people basically so there's some kind of weird rule with that yeah it's typical the uci uh, but i know that corner uh, tried to reach uh, the uci to get uh, to try to get more reach on his bike but it was not possible even though he was 204 centimeters and it's, we need to fit into uh, some regulations uh, but it's obviously that I'm, I should have a, I should have other rules because I'm much, I'm much bigger than them. And I remember when I started doing TTs in juniors, I think it was even 10 centimeters shorter than now. I was like, I was sitting like shit on a bike, but I'm trying to get the best out of it. Um, now it's the rules and I have to uh, yeah, fit under them. And I think it's, it's okay but sometimes i would i wish that i could have uh, the same rules as in the triathlon where there is no rules uh, because i would like to sit like beat the cabinets and, and guys like that but it's just not possible yeah as long as the rules are there so as a as you're quite accomplished time trialer already what kind of tips would you give to anyone who wants to improve their time trialing like what kind of training do you do to get better i think actually uh, yeah you can do a lot on your bike obviously uh, buy a new uh, buy good tires and and just think like does this look like in the, in the 90s or does this look like now because you see different pictures from uh, when when miguel indorine was riding he's he's looking really funny and uh, and right now they're looking quite different but if that's one thing, but uh, I find it really good to do a 20 minute test once every second week, just to try to reach your limit and try to try to break that just to even in December, just to, you know, feel like you're doing a TT all year round, because otherwise you will get a little bit rusty in the start. You see that with a lot of riders, they are not able to perform in a one day TT. But doing the Tour de France, they uh, literally rips everyone up. I think that's just to train like you're doing a TT, do a proper warm up, and then do a 20 minutes all out. And each time you will see that you are getting better and better to to pace yourself. I think that would be my best advice to to become successful. Because if you can, if you on one year can do like. I don't know, 20, 20, 20 minutes test. Then you, when you reach the, the national, so it's a big goal for you. Um, then you have tried every kind of, what do we call it? Um, yeah, you have tried to do a test during uh, one of your worst days and, and also one of your best days. So if you start out doing uh, maybe uh, 20 watts uh, less than you, you, your race plan was, uh, then you know how your body will react at the end. So just get out there and, and try to train your TT uh, and do threshold TTs. Do your, your easy rides on the TT. Uh, you need to train really much on it. Uh, sometimes when I'm, when I'm comp uh, preparing for TT like Worlds uh, or Nationals, I'm doing eight out of 10 rides on my TT. I only race on my road bike and then I train everything on my TT bike because you need to find that extra two watts or whatever it is. Maybe it's only one watt. At the end, it's, it's really much because the competition is getting tougher and tougher and you need to, yeah, just get, get the marginal gain. And if, if the marginal gain is uh, that you need to do six hours on your TT bike, yeah, then you need to do six hours on your TT bike. It's, really old school to think that you only need to train TTs when you have a big goal in front of you. You need to train the TT uh, all year round. Also, if you are competitive uh, GC contender, I think it would be really important for you to, to just have your TT with you at home all year round and 
maybe do one or two rides every week uh, whole year round but when i look at people i i see that they just want to ride in in the mountains and and have fun uh, gravel rides av- adventures and stuff like that ever resting but maybe they should start to uh, take the tt a little bit a little bit more seriously because you see a lot of the the Grand Tours are, are won by a good CT rider, like Christopher Froome. You saw Naira Quintana uh, losing the, the Tour with one minute uh, or something like that. But if he just gained a little bit on CT, he would have won. And I think that could have been possible because he has a phenomenal FTP. And uh, by his side, I think it would be possible to maybe not ride as fast as uh, Christopher Froome on the CTs, but you could get really, really close. Because I would always say that a guy like uh, Martin Tuff, he's been Danish champion three years in a row. He's a small guy and it's old school to think that just because you're big and tall, then you must be good at CTs because it, it's not a game to be big. You need to be as small as possible. You need to fit good into the air. Uh, so being a small rider, it's not that, it's not a worst case. Sometimes it is, uh, it's, it's the best option to have. So um, yeah, train hard on the TG bike is, is what, also I've got a long talk now, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's interesting. So final question, we probably know this already, but with you explaining that you like the cobblestones and the time trial, but who was kind of your hero growing up? First, this was Cancelado. But then, then I started to, when I was 15, I started to grow like uh, insanely much. And I was reaching the two meters uh, in a really early age. So I was looking into riders like Stein and uh, and guys like that. So my heart has always been uh, for, for the classics because Stein Fandenberg is not a really good TG rider. So I was just like comparing me to him. But I still think that day to day that Cancelada has been my biggest uh, inspiration during uh, my childhood. Also Tom Boone and, and guys like that. I'm not watching much uh, bike racing, but when it's classic season, I'm watching every goddamn race. I don't care about any uh, other uh, state race. I would like to do them myself, but, but watching them is like, I really have other things to do. Uh, but classics is, is special. All right. Thanks for this, Matthias. Matthias also has a podcast. We have a few Danish watchers. So uh, I'll put a link in the description for that. But thanks very much for your time, Matthias. And hope your leg heals up soon. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this lockdown interview with Matthias. If you're new here, why not check out my other interviews with some Danish pros, such as Miguel Honoré of Quickstep or a quarter of the Danish Team Pursuit team in the form of Julius Johansson. And also thank you to anyone who subscribed as we've just passed the 1,500 mark. And as always, thank you for watching and see you next time.